Good afternoon, my name is Kyushin and this is my oral presentation on a research paper titled Brush and Blues Reveal Effects of Language on Colored Discrimination by Winnower and Colleagues. So different languages have different ways of dividing color space, that is, the spectrum at which some languages define the color boundaries differs. For example, in the English language, the term blue would be used to describe all of these colors. However, the Russian language makes a clear distinction between what we would refer to as light and dark blue into different colors entirely. These are known as goloboy and sini. This distinction is made so clear that the Russian language has no singular word for the color blue. And this probably feels strange to us English speakers, but compared to other languages, we divide color space strangely too. In fact, many languages do not distinctly categorize between pink and red as we naturally do. So, do these linguistic differences affect how we perceive and experience color? The question of linguistic differences in color perception has resulted in a long debate sparking much intrigue into the way that languages shape thinking, which feeds into a broader area of the literature exploring the Whorfian hypothesis. This is also known as linguistic relativity and generally explores how languages influence thoughts and perceptions. However, evidence of cross-linguistic differences in color perception have left much of the scientific community unconvinced due to the subjective nature of previous experimental designs. Overall, because much of the previous research has relied on memory procedures and subjective judgments, the mystery of the effects of language on color perception remain. Given all of this, the researchers of the present studied wondered whether or not this difference between the color space division has an effect on the way that English speakers and Russian speakers experience and discriminate color. In other words, does a color boundary being present in one language, Russian in this case, but in another, make them two language groups differ in their perceptual discrimination performance across a certain color boundary? And if that's the case, would a verbal interference within the discrimination task affect only the performance of the language group that makes the linguistic distinction? But before I go any further, you may be thinking, wait, don't us English speakers make a linguistic distinction too? I mean, we have the terms light and dark blue. How is that different from Golaboy and Sini? And we can still clearly discriminate between the two. And it's a fair concern. And in fact, the English speakers drew almost identical boundaries between light and dark blue as Russian speakers did for Golaboy and Sini. The critical point is not that English speakers cannot discriminate between these shades, but that Russian speakers cannot avoid doing so. These light and dark blues are merely clarifications of a colour we see as one, whereas Russian speakers habitually make the distinction between colour boy and cine in everyday life. Hopefully, having cleared that up, I'll move on to the methodology. Compared to previous designs, colour discrimination performance in this study was measured in a simple objective perceptual task. The subjects were shown three blue colored squares arranged in a triad and asked which of the bottom two squares match the top square. In some trials, the distractor square, that is the non-identical bottom square, was from the same Russian category as the match square, the identical square. That is, both squares were either from the gullaboy or Sini category. These were known as the within category trials. In other trials, the distractor square and the match square were from different Russian blue categories, also known as the cross category trials, and these were arguably the easier trials. Furthermore, a verbal interference trial was included in which participants silently rehearsed an eight digit string series while simultaneously completing the task. The researchers hypothesized that if the effects of language on color discrimination are specific to the categories encoded in one's language, then Russian speakers should be better at making cross-category discriminations rather than within-category ones. This is what the researchers refer to as a category advantage. Furthermore, the researchers postulated that if language plays an active role in perceptual tasks, then a verbal interference trial should diminish the category advantage of Russian speakers. So, what did the researchers find? In the figure below, the y-axis represents the mean reaction time, and the x-axis represents whether there was a verbal interference trial or not. The grey bars are the cross-category trials, and the white bars represent the within-category trials. As you can see, Russian speakers showed a category advantage in the no-interference trials. That is, Russian speakers were faster at discriminating colours if they fell into different linguistic categories in Russian, as opposed to the colours falling into the same category. However, this category advantage was disrupted by a verbal interference task. 
On the other hand, English speakers did not show a category advantage in any of the trials, meaning that it did not matter for them whether the trials were cross or within category. The results of this experiment suggest that color categories embedded in one's language affect performance on even basic perceptual tasks. These processes may arise from an interaction between lower level perceptual processing and high level knowledge systems, that is language. As was demonstrated here, temporarily disabling access to higher level knowledge systems, language in this case, affected participants' category advantage. Exactly how these interactions occur remains unknown, however. To conclude, much of the previous research has explored whether or not language influences perception, and these questions are often phrased in a way that assumes that linguistic and non-linguistic processes are disconnected. However, results from experiments such as this one suggest that, that this is not the case and that language can be brought online even for simple perceptual tasks, providing strong support for the Wolfian hypothesis. And I found this quote from Wolf himself, Language is not simply a reporting device for experience, but a defining framework for it. And I think this perfectly summarizes the essence of linguistic relativity. So a different approach instead would be to ask, to what extent is language embedded in everyday life and in seemingly non-linguistic tasks? Thank you for listening and feel free to ask any questions or get clarifications on anything.